Good morning, everybody. And, you know, when we looked and saw that Sunday fell on the 1st of May, we just couldn't resist it, really. I mean, we couldn't resist it. And, you know, this, we, what we really want, and how amazing this weather. Isn't it fantastic? I woke up yesterday, I got out. <laughs> yesterday, I got out, and it was like sheets of snow going across the, oh no, we're going to do May Day tomorrow. And then today, I woke up, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, just, th- there's going to need to be a bit of context setting. You know, we're in church, we're doing this, why are we doing this? How is it all coming about? So, if you'd like to just relax into it, then we'll set a bit of a context as to, how this is uh, going to develop and come about. The word spring itself comes from the old English, English word springen, which means to leap forward. So the spring really is about leaping forward. And at this time, like animals in hibernation, you know, hopefully we find new energy in this season of promise. And we launch, hopefully, our spring cleaning projects. You know, we shed our heavy coats. I noticed there are no coats on the coat rack today, which I'm very pleased to see. And, and many of us, you know, we get into the garden, we sprout seeds, you know, we do all that sort of stuff and germinate them and they start to grow. And there's a sudden new energy that comes in. And what we're here to do today is to link in with that new energy and to have it come into our hearts. Those of you that come, if you want to find a few seats, there are some around the place. There's one there and one there. So do feel free to that. Now, we have a relationship with that. And also, this is a particular time of year. You know, did you know that today is the Russian and Greek Orthodox Easter? It's Easter Day if you're in Russia or Greece. And the pagan goddess of spring and renewal is called Oyster. And it's from Scandinavia, the Ostra, and the Teutonic Ostern and Easter who were the goddess of fertility. And that's really where we get the name Easter. It comes from that basic root. And in the second century, this is a bit of a history lesson here. The second century, Christians began to see parallels between the the pagan spring rites and the ritual and the resurrection. And more and more, the pagan customs were assimilated into Christian Easter celebrations because the two the renewal, the two came together like that. You know, we tend to shy away, particularly in Christian churches, from the idea of the pagan. You know, this is very pagan, they always say. But actually, the word pagan comes from the Latin word, which simply means villager or rustic or, and I like this one, non-combatant. That's where the basic word comes from. That's the basic form of that being. And, you know, without those pagan roots, without that pagan villager understanding, we'd never been able to assimilate. There's a sort of level of understanding, that villager level. And the Christian faith, the Christian understanding fits on top of that. And without that, you wouldn't be able to understand the concepts because it requires that basic language to be able to understand that. And in many ways, The Christian concepts are built on the old pagan concepts. For example, one theory of why we have Christmas on December the 25th was because it's the same day as the pagan festival of the birth of the unconquered sun, a festival inaugurated by the Romans in the third century. So, you know, we built our Christian culture on all these sorts of things. And we've, you know, adopted this time of Easter, if you want to come sit on the floor at all, uh, do feel free to do that if you're just, just coming in. You know, we've adopted some of the pagan rituals. Eggs were a very pagan thing, where we have Easter eggs. And guess which was the sacred animal for that time for pagans? It was the bunny. It was the hare, actually. But of course, we've translated into the bunny. And that's where we get the Easter eggs and the Easter bunnies from. And there's something really primeval about it. And primeval means early in life, the first of the age. And in welcoming spring, there's something deep within us upon which is built. I'm going to have to sit there, I'm afraid. Uh, so Richard, do you mind sitting there? I'm going to have to sit there. You just sit. That's great. All my stuff's just over there. Great. Just have a seat over there. That's great. Um, 
something primeval, which means the first of the age. And in welcoming spring, something deep within us and upon which, you know, is built all the intellectual stuff, that feeling, that sense of beginning. And, you know, I think we deny all that at our peril. We deny that basic stuff at our peril. And if we let those basic urges go, those spring-like urges, then, you know, underneath we create a void of expression. And it goes to make whatever faith we have slightly disconnected because it's not linked into the earth. It's not linked into the seasons. It's not linked into our concepts of reality from the connection to the movement of the cosmos. And we need to be connected in order for our faith to be real. It's just, otherwise, it's just an intellectual exercise, you know. I believe in this. But it's different from believing to participating in it. And really what we're about here is participating in it, being connected to it all. So our greater understanding of the nature of reality is rooted in that connection. And that's what we're here today to do. We're here to reach into ourselves, each individual to reach into our combined memories, touching the deep part of ourselves that's connected to the movement of the cosmos. Because I've said this before, but whether you like it or not, all your body is made up of carbon atoms that were spewed out at the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. And so therefore, you know, however we think about it, however we intellectualize it, we are basically carbon atoms. And we're subject to the forces of the universe, the cosmos, the ordering. We're subject to that. And what we're here to do is to let go into that experience, to let go into that ordering, and to do a rite of spring that makes a connection to all that. So are you up for that? Are you up for that? Good. OK, so I'm going to come sit next to Camilla. Sorry to move you there, Roger. But so why, what I'm going to ask you to do now is in a moment, you can put down all your bits of paper and everything like that. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. This is one of those eyes closed bits. So, uh, and it's just relaxing into it. You don't have to do anything. There's no getting up at this point. No one's going to touch you. You'll be totally OK. So I'm going to invite you. So when you're ready, I want you to close your eyes. And just notice the most basic way that we're connected to the cosmos, which is our breathing. Atoms in, atoms out. Oxygen into carbon dioxide. So notice you're breathing in and you're breathing out and focus on that breath. The feeling in your nostrils as you breathe in and out. Let go of all other thoughts. Notice them and let them go, but just focus on your breath. Now deepen your breathing just a bit and feel the relaxedness in your body. Be completely at peace with your body. The aches and pains, the sensations, the chair that you're sitting on. Just be in your body. Now bring your attention to those either side of you and include them in your consciousness. Aware of them being and existing with you. Just the three of you. And now widen your attention to include the whole circle, all of us, 
as a small community of beingness. Carbon atom. Breathing in, breathing out. And just be with that connection. Now go back into yourself and try and locate your own desire to make a contribution to your community, to those around you, to bring joy or love or peace or whatever you have to offer. Locate that within yourself. Imagine a spring within yourself that will push that contribution out, bubbling up into the community, into the town. And as it comes out, imagine the season changing around us. Imagine the tree turning to green, the mountains, the fields, the flowers, all coming into bloom. And as they do, feel the energy coming through you. Paint the picture for yourself and allow it to build and grow. Would you like to be seated? Okay, so I think we're going to come into the elephant in the room now, which is the maypole. <laughs> so the maypole is a tall wooden pole that was erected in various European festivals around which the dance of the maypole would occur. And the festivals traditionally occurred on May Day 
which is the, the 1st of May. And it's been recorded in practice. Germany was a place that happened a lot in Europe throughout the medieval and modern periods. And it became less popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. And today the tradition is still observed, it says in Wikipedia, in some parts of Europe and among European communities in North America. So here we are as a, North, as a European, well, I'm European anyway, community. Now, the symbolism of the maypole, and I'd like to say this is not R-rated, so you don't have to worry about it. The symbolism of the maypole has been debated many times, and lots of folklorists in the centuries have talked about it. And you'll be pleased to hear there is no set conclusion as to what it represents. You know, there is the whole phallic idea which is there. However, most people also, the other idea to that is that this represents the axis of the world. And I like that because it's the cosmos turning around the axis of the world. And therefore, it is the, the two poles. And it's what's called in Latin, axis mundi, the axis of the world. And when, you're uh, when the, the children are dancing, you'll see the world going around its axis. And that is the idea of the cosmos. And that's a wonderful concept. Just like, you know, the earth goes around the sun and the planets go around. So we symbolize that and it's us actually participating in that. And that's the whole axis Monday. And that, that, that theory is, is quite a big theory. But the, the thing that most people think that it's about the maypole is that it's the, the Germanic tradition of the sacred tree. It's the Germanic tradition of the sacred tree. And there's evidence of sacred trees and wooden pillars that go right the way back into history in Germanic Europe. It was known things like Thor's oak. And the cosmological view is that, 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 that the, uh, the universe was a tree and everything flowed around the tree. And the maypoles were simply a part of the rejoicing of the return of spring and the growth of the new vegetation. If you look at it, what, what, what's going to happen is Underneath that is just a white tree. And what those ribbons represent is the flowers appearing on the tree. It is like the tree blooms and comes into flower. And therefore we watch spring happening as the maypole garlands and everything goes round it. And you know, the practice became increasingly popular throughout the you know, Middle Ages with maypoles being a communal symbol of coming together. And, you know, and we like to think of ourselves in Aspen Chapel as a community. And this is a community event. It is a, a coming together around the axis. And the dance around the map, maple looks back to the idea of the tree being transformed. As they go around, the ribbons create that, those flowers. And the children that performed it represent new growth. Children and young adults uh, tend to do that, representing new growth growth, mirroring the circling around the cosmos and encouraging fertility and growth. In Just, a poem by E.E. E. Cummings. In just spring, when the world is mud luscious, the little lame balloon man whistles far and wee, and Eddie and Bill come running from marbles and piracies, and it's spring. When the world is puddle wonderful, the queer old balloon man whistles far and weak. And Betty and Isabel come dancing from hopscotch and jump rope, and it's spring. And the goat footed balloon man whistles far and wee. Thank you, Stephen. Well, I think, you know, in a sense, something's been lost in the way that we experience ourselves spiritually, particularly in conjunction with, you know, with, in being connected with the nature of reality. You know, in, in all religions, we address, you know, what we think of as being the great themes of the day. You know, we think that our morals are important and our behavior. We think that the way that we treat each other is important. And you can see, you know, what our values are really in the Judeo-Christian tradition by looking at the Ten Commandments, you know. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me, make no idols, not take the name of the Lord in vain, keep the Sabbath holy, honor your father and mother, not murder, not commit adultery, not steal, not bear false witness, not covet. You know, all very important to us as humanity. But what about the bigger picture? You know, what about the animals 
and the plants or the earth. You know, this week being Earth Day. What about all that? That doesn't seem to be included very much in the Ten Commandments. And when you look at the earth from space, that beautiful green and blue orb, you know, quite honestly, how important are the Ten Commandments to that? You know, how does it bear? You know, religion is so much about how we behave. You know, even love the Lord your God with your heart and all your mind and all your strength. Love the Lord, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. All that is about how we behave. And the danger is with all that, it's all up here. It's all in our minds. It's all in our thoughts. And it's all in our bodies and, you know, what we think and feel as beings, individuals. But what about all the rest? What about all the other stuff that's not related to us? What about, you know, humanity, thinking of humanity? What about thinking of humanity as the ultimate flower of the earth? That humanity, that we are actually, individually, we are the flowers of the earth, connected and mothered by the earth. And remember, it is Mother's Day next week. And we will be returning to that next week. We'll be having a special service of the feminine next week. And the earth is connected and mothered. The earth is connected and mothered by the universe. The fundamental interconnectedness of all matter. You know, where is that? You know, we have ideas about enlightenment being about interconnectedness and all that sort of business. You know, we do link it in there. But, you know, earth day is about the reality of it. It's about earth. It's about microbes, about plants, insects, and animals being involved in one planet, connected in one planet. You know, that whole idea of the Gaia theory that proposes that organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings on the earth to form, we react all of it together to form a synergistic, self-regulating complex system that helps us maintain and perpetuate the conditions for life on Earth. There is an interconnectedness with all things going on. The Gaia theory talks about how the biosphere and the evolution of life forms, all that affects the stability of the global temperature. We know all about that. Ocean salinity, oxygen in the atmosphere, the maintenance of the hydrosphere of liquid water and other environmental valuables that affect the habitat of the Earth. And that hypothesis, the interconnectedness, was formed by James Lovelock. And he called it the Gaia theory. And Gaia comes from the word, the idea of the earth as a goddess. The Greek Gaia, the spouse of Uranus, mother of the Titans, the personification of earth, that goddess. That's where the Gaia word comes from. And, you know, we are part of that. We are part of that interconnectedness. I love the idea of thinking, you know, about the earth's survival. You know, is the earth going to survive? Well, of course the earth will survive. The only question is whether humanity will survive or not, or will go the way of the dinosaurs. You know, the earth will be here. And what we're doing here is making, what we're doing here now in this rite is making a connection with the earth and the cosmos. Demonstrating that we know that we are part of something bigger than ourselves, but also that we're connected to it. And we are part of it. We too, individually, are spring. And we play our part in it. And we must play our part in the harvest as well when that comes along. And in the winter. And that is all part of our religion. Religion comes from the word re ligari, which means to go through again in terms of re, again, ligari, to read. It means to read through again. It has a concept religion of seasons. You go through it again and again, and you re-experience it, rereading every day, week and year. The book, the book that is our lives. And I love the idea of nature being the fifth gospel. Nature is the fifth gospel. And that's what I think it means in Genesis when it says that the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. We have to play our part in that, just as the earth does, just as microbes do, just as insects do, and other plants and animals do. And our part is much greater because we have consciousness of the process. We are conscious of the process of it going on. And the purpose of our spiritual lives is to serve this vision. 
not by imposing our own ideas and stripping the, the earth of its wealth for our own consumption, but by serving the cosmos, by being part of a greater wheel of life that flows in our everything. The wheel of life that flows through us and we are part of like a perfect clock. Everything goes round and round like plants, like gravity, like life and death, in and out, round and round. Rocks are hard and water's wet. That really should be our enlightenment. Rocks are hard and water's wet. Flowing in the will of God, subject to the Lord of the dance. Flowing in the will of God, subject to the Lord of the dance. And our task is to perform that dance unselfishly. Our task is to perform that dance unselfishly. And if we do that, we become the servant of all. And life is able to continue on its way to greater consciousness until at last all things find their place in the perfect image of the divine spirit. At last, all things find their place if we play our part in the perfect image of the divine spirit, which of course is what the second coming is. But that's another message. So that's what we're doing here today. We're participating. We're mirroring the great cosmic dance of life. We're saying we're part of that. We're acknowledging ourselves. We're giving ourselves up. Notice not one of those children that was dancing was any more special than the other child. We are all the same. So let's just rest in that and just, uh, just say a couple of prayers. Because while we're doing this, we do want to just remember those who in our community are struggling at the moment, struggling to be part of that dance. We think of those we know in our hearts, particularly those known to our community, Patricia Hill, Lucy Crichton, Barbara Orcutt, Georgia Ortiz, Will Welsh, Philip Hodgson, the Guy Lander family, whose grandfather Frank died last week. Kim Rogers, who's got a badly broken leg. Critchell Bryce, Jonathan Bryce's daughter, who's in constant head pain. A family of baby Frisher Britt, son of Mark, Mike Britt and Jan, who died recently after living only one hour. A family of Lorna Peterson, whose father Tage died last week. And we give thanks for the Hancock family as Margaret had a baby girl, Lydia, this week. And we just think of those that we know that are struggling. Pray that they can take their place in this dance. Pray for our town and those visiting, for our country and our world and all the struggles and difficulties and entanglements that they too may be subject to the perfect ordering of love. Amen.